And in Nehemiah's day, we see on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth with earth on their heads. They come in in repentance. And the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. They stood in their place and read from the book of the Lord of Jehovah their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped Jehovah their God. He said, you, Jehovah, you alone, you have made heaven and the earth and the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. You are Jehovah, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, the Girgashite, and you have kept your promise for you were righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers, and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them, so they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and judgments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by, your, by Moshe, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water from them out of a rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously, this is where Zud and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, and they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. So the stiff-necked and stubborn are what? They are disobedient. They forget all that Yehovah has done for them. They hanker after the things of the world. They look back to Egypt. They act presumptuously. This word here, zood. They acted presumptuously, zood, and we can see this word here, mapped out. This presumptuous arrogance seems to be an ongoing trait in the history of those calling themselves Yehovah's people. Proud is a part of it. They are disobedient, and yet they regard themselves as entitled. They presume all will be well despite being warned. And I just think, does this description of these people, recognizing all that Yehovah has done for them, and then he says, but they were presumptuous. They were disobedient. They actually looked to the world. And yet, within themselves, they had this expectation that everything was going to be well. Even though you said to them, oh, if you carry on like this, this is going to go really bad. No, they were presumptuous. And I just think, wow, what a description of where most of the world of Christianity is actually at today. For an example of this word used elsewhere in Scripture, this zoot, this presumptuous arrogance, Entitlements. Let's go back to last week's Parsha and Moshe's recalling of events after the spies came back with an evil report of the promised land. Deuteronomy 1. They took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it to us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land that Jehovah our God is giving us. Yet you would not go up but rebelled against the command of Jehovah your God. You murmured in your tents and said, Because Jehovah hated us, he's brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are our going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of Anakim, their giants. And we've looked at that before. The Hebrew word for than we is the same as the Hebrew word for than him. So actually what they're doubting is Yehovah. The people are greater and taller than him. It could equally as well read. The people seemingly forgot everything that Yehovah had done for them. I put there, do not forget, it is a big part of this portion. They despised the pleasant land. They had no faith in his promise. As we read in Psalm 106, they murmured in their tents. Oh, and look what they didn't do. They did not shema Yehovah. Back to Deuteronomy 1. And I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. Yehovah, your God, goes before you. We will fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. 
And in the wilderness where you've seen how Jehovah, your God, carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe Jehovah, your God. He went up before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night and a cloud by day to show you by what way you should go. And Jehovah heard your words and he was angered and he swore, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to your fathers. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. To him and his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed Jehovah. And that's another important part of this Parsha. Complete and utter obedience, completely surrendered to Jehovah. Even with me, Jehovah was angry on your account. He said, you shall not go in there. Which is an amazing example of the truth that Peter utters when he said, God is no respecter of persons which is a good verse for all the arrogance and the presumptuous, all those who are azud. And Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, you shall enter, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. As for your little ones, who you said would become a prey, and your children, who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and journey into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. And what we see next is the reaction of a people who cannot accept that they will not inherit the promises of Jehovah. They cannot believe that things will not work out for them. Then you answered me, we have sinned against Jehovah. We ourselves will go up and fight just as Jehovah God had commanded us. And every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it was easy to go up into the hill country. So they confess, they'll say, now we'll go, it'll be fine. Another part of this Parsha is the recognizing... Um, just how big a part Jehovah plays in the victories that we enjoy in our life. And because it's not always immediately evident and obvious, people get this sense of pumped up arrogance like, no, we can do it. It's all us. As we see here, just the same thing going on. You thought it would be easy to go up even though Jehovah was not with you. Jehovah said to, to me, say to them, do not go up or fight for I'm not in your midst lest you be defeated before your enemies. So it wasn't fine. And he would see that without Jehovah, there is no victory. I spoke to you, you would not listen. You rebelled against the command of Jehovah and presumptuously went to the hill country. It's this word again. These are a rebellious people, they're disobedient. They confess that they are sinners, but there's no repentance. They are arrogant and prideful. And the result, the Amorites who lived in the hill country came out against you, chased you as bees do, and beat you down in Seir as far as Hummah. You returned and wept before Jehovah, but Jehovah did not listen to your voice or give ear to you. So people who lack faith, who forget all that Jehovah has done for them, disobedience, hankering after the things of the world, yet they are zooed. They have this sense that, oh, it's all going to work out great, presumptuous and arrogant. They expect to inherit the promises of Jehovah, they think all will be well, well despite warnings. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. People generally are unaware of their true situation. And there is this arrogant presumptuousness that everything is going to work out for me. I'm not obeying the Lord. There's these things in my life which are terribly wrong. But you know what? It's actually going to be great. Why is it going to be great? Well, the sentence against this, what I'm doing, it's not immediate, so I'm not feeling the consequences now. So I'll just live in this deluded world. Let my presumptuous arrogance carry me through this. Despite the warnings, I'm going to think everything's going to be great. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well for those who fear God because they fear before him. And to fear Jehovah is to keep his commandments. We see in Psalm 112, praise Jehovah, blessed is the man who fears Jehovah, who greatly delights in his commandments. I know that it will be well with those who fear Jehovah. I know it will be well with those who walk in Jehovah's ways. Those who cherish the word can enjoy real assurance. That's where we were at. Another example of the word zood found in scripture relates to those who would speak nonsense and claim to be given Jehovah's word. Deuteronomy 18 says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command them. Speaking of Yeshua. And he says, and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume, and it's this word again, to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded, 
him to speak, or that she'll speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So here we have the word zood connected to false prophets. Zood, the word connected with disobedience. Prideful arrogance is also connected then with false prophets. Even those who would falsely assume the position of speaking as on behalf of Yehovah. Back to Nehemiah 9. Despite Yehovah's great goodness, they and our fathers acted presumptuously. And they would have had false prophets backing them up saying everything's going to be fine. Stiff in their neck, did not obey your commandments. This presumptuous arrogance, an ongoing trait in the history of those calling themselves Jehovah's people. Disobedient, yet they regard themselves entitled. This presumptuous arrogance, speaking nonsense as if on behalf of Jehovah. This is exactly what still goes on today. And from Nehemiah 9, we see exactly what sort of people these are. They refuse to obey. They refuse to shema. Um, were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to uh, return to their slavery in Egypt. In other words, they want to go back to the world and that life. Disobedient, hanging after the things of the world. They most likely want all the promises, as people tend to, but they have no desire to be set apart, to be holy to Jehovah. So the question is, do you claim to belong to Jehovah? Yet you're stiff-necked and you don't obey him. You want the blessings, but you want to carry on like the world does. If so, you're not holy. Please note, it is on the heels of behaving like the world. You're not going to be blessed above all peoples. That's not going to be you. I might not keep all the commandments, but I walk according to the Spirit. I'll ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Jehovah's spirit of holiness is the spirit of truth. We saw what the truth was, your word is the truth. Even Yeshua said it. He said, sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. Jehovah's word is truth, his spirit is truth. To walk according to the word and to walk according to the spirit are the same thing. And this is what causes you to be holy and set apart, to be part of Jehovah's holy nation and to be blessed above all peoples. Living according to the flesh compared with living according to the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Quite a difference. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God and it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. The mind in the flesh does not shema does not submit to Yehovah. Those in the flesh do not obey the Torah. Those who are in the flesh can't please God. Those who do not obey Torah cannot please Yehovah. Yeshua, who was without sin, which is the transgression of the Torah, said this, He who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. What is pleasing to him? To walk in his ways, not to walk in the flesh, which is to disobey the Torah. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So if the Spirit of God of the, or the Spirit of Messiah, one and the same, dwells in you, then you will not walk according to the flesh. You will not disobey the Torah if you are his and his Spirit dwells in you. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, of transgressing the Torah. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness, righteousness we see in Deuteronomy 6.25 is to walk according with the commandments, is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. So if the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Messiah dwells in you, then you will not disobey the Torah. Ezekiel 36, I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, you'll keep my judgments and do them. Who is it that has his spirit? Romans 8. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, i.e. submitted to Torah, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. It is these people who were submitted to the Torah to whom Jehovah says, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And you will be blessed above all the peoples who are on the earth. Those that submit to Torah are Messiahs. They are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. They are blessed above all people. And many who refuse to submit to the Torah claim to be Messiahs and convince themselves and some around them 
but they are none of his. And often they actually quite ironically use the phrases, I walk according to the Spirit. Not realizing how nonsensical that is. Because to walk according to the Spirit is to be submitted to his word. They are not Abraham's seed. Uh, they will not enter into the promises and blessings to come. Yeshua addresses those who claim to be Abraham's children. They are people who have their sense of entitlement, considering themselves to be heirs according to the promise. They said, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. What did Abraham do? Abraham shamad. He shamad my voice and kept my commandments. And uh, indeed, Yeshua goes on to say, whoever is of God, and it's this word again, akua, which means shema, the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And this is said to people who would have been absolutely, utterly convinced that they were the people of God. And of course, he is akua, who is related to shemad, which is the word used in Genesis 26, 5. You see it there. So effectively what it's saying Whoever is of God shemars the word of God. And you people who consider yourselves to be God's people, you're not his. Going back to Nehemiah 9, they refused to shemar, were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. Even when they'd made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. You and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they should go. You and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them day by day nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the, which, the way they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. You gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner so they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Rather than forgetting what Jehovah has done for them, these people in Nehemiah 9 are coming to Jehovah in repentance and they're making a point of remembering. We're called to remember. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and you brought them into the land that you told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, gave them into the hand with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities in a rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and they were filled and they became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, all this amazing stuff, they were disobedient, rebelled against you, and cast your law behind their back. And killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. So this is how the people behave when all is going well. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering they cried out to you. And you heard from heaven. And according to your great mercies you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest they did evil again before you. And you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that you had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they did what? Well, they acted presumptuously again. They did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules. Which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder, stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, our God, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us. 
upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria to this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our princes, our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. And it's just like that today. People, <clears throat> people are doing well and they just don't want to know the Lord. People come and warn them and they're just not interested. No, you're all right. Even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you <clears throat> or turn from your wicked, wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. This is what happens in the, uh, the consequences come to bear. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed documents of the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So things are now bad, and then they repent. And you continue on, you can see the names of all these people, and the rest of the people, and the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the Lord of God, Wives, sons, daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding. Join with their brothers, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moshe, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of Jehovah our Lord and his rules and his statutes. And it's just an amazing example of what actually happens to people who are arrogant and presumptuous. They've been given so much, and yet they refuse to walk in Jehovah's ways. And you can summarize what we've just read. The people are in distress, they're slaves. They come before Jehovah to confess their sins and repent. They recall their history and it all begins with an acknowledgement of Jehovah as creator of all things. Then Abraham, you found his heart faithful before you. Then we have a recalling of all that Jehovah has done for his people. He took them out of slavery with the plagues, the partner of the Red Sea. He's led them, he's given them laws at Mount Sinai. He's given them manna. The response, they refuse to obey were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They stiffened their neck. They acted presumptuously with arrogant pride. Even we had the um, golden calf they made for themselves. You in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. You continued to look after them. Forty years you sustained them and they lacked nothing. You'd even give them victories, kingdoms and peoples allotted to them from every corner. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and you brought them into the land. So they ate, they were filled, they became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient, rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back, killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And then they suffer and they cry out, Jehovah is merciful, they are blessed, they go astray. They suffer, they cry out, Jehovah is merciful. Many years you bore with them, warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously, did not obey your commandments. As we said before, those who were zooed are more likely to listen to false prophets. And you'll always find them. People who want to be disobedient will always find people who will come along and tell them that it's okay. And they'll feed this presumptuous arrogance, this self, this entitlement, this, they'll just speak little tickly words that they want to hear. Time goes by, nothing changes. There are those today who give, who give warning and call people back to obedience. There are those who presume to speak on behalf of Jehovah, but who do not bring his word. And there are those who, despite Jehovah's great goodness, despite the many blessings in their life, simply refuse to humble themselves before Jehovah. They're stiff-necked, yet they presume to be entitled. So why do people go astray? Got all these blessings for being obedient, all these wonderful things. Why do people go astray? Why do they choose sin? Because they like it. <clears throat> it's what they want. Some clips, uh, pictures there from Pleasure Island and the story of Pinocchio. It's, oh, this looks great. Trouble is, though, they want the blessings. They want the security, the peace, the prosperity, and the joy. But, as we saw before, the fruit of going after the flesh is not life and peace. It is death. 
And each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. 